Hi everyone, my name is Jackie Thompson and I'm here today to talk about Project Respond, which is currently our mobile crisis team for Multnomah County. For those of you not familiar with this area, it is over here in Portland, Oregon. And I thought I'd start with how we got started. Project Respond got started as an outreach and engagement team. It was a very small team, consisted of three crisis workers working the day shift Monday through Friday, with the primary goal of engaging the majority of houseless folks in the downtown Portland area experiencing mental illness. Fast forward a few years, and in 2001 was when we signed our contract to provide emergency mobile crisis response for mental health emergencies. 24 seven in the entire county. Our current contract allows for 26 FTE and we are required to run 24 seven. We do not shut down for any reason. And then I wanted to go in what it looks like currently. So our current team is multidisciplinary. It's a combination of master's level, undergraduate level and peer providers. We run in teams of two, and it can be um, a conglomerate of any one of those three uh, providers, but we will always make sure that we have at least one uh, master's level clinician for our director's custody holds that I'll talk about in just a little bit. So we run in teams of two all day long, and we get our referrals from two sources only. The majority of referrals, 90 some percent of our referrals come from our county crisis line. Currently, I wanted to throw in there that 988 is also collaborating with our crisis line to make sure that we can get referrals from 988 as well. And then our second referral source is directly from police officers. And what kind of calls do we go on? We go on emergency mental health calls. The majority of time we're responding to somebody who's thinking about suicide or expressing homicidal ideation. We also do behaviors, behavioral volatility concerns. And that's kind of these fancy words. So I always try to give a picture of what that might look like because it's not black and white, it can be really gray. What we're really looking for is concerning behaviors that feel different or have changed and someone that's calling or a loved one or someone calling for themselves isn't sure why and is very concerned about it. This can look like suicidal ideation, so thoughts of hurting, that's hurting oneself with plan to do that, access to means to follow through with that, active threats, threats recent changes in behavior, psychosis, mania, the list can go on. We're really just trying to go out and figure out how someone is currently doing and if they're okay. We only actually, when I thought about this, have two outcomes. They look very different for each individual, but there's really only two. We either write a director's custody hold, which I'll abbreviate to be a DCH, or the person remains in the community and we do a safety plan, support plan, and referrals. Director's custody holds are what we are able to provide. And if you have to be a master's level clinician and you go through an additional training for the county because we're doing it on behalf of the county. And what that allows us to do is involuntarily, so someone not wanting to go, we, want, we involuntarily transport them to the hospital for further evaluation. And we do not take that lightly. Something to note is it is our civil right to decide what care we want or to decide what care we do not want. We can refuse care up to a certain point. We have to make a case, of course, to do that. And we have to make a case that says someone is in immediate, eminent danger of hurting themselves or someone else. And we have to really write in exactly what proves that to make them go against their will to the hospital. 
And then for us, it's at the hospital that they do the further evaluation of potentially keeping someone who doesn't want to be there even longer. But we just initiate the initial transfer to the hospital. Um, one thing that I just forgot to note is the majority of outcomes, over 90% is this community plan. Somebody is remaining in the community and we're trying to find supports for that. Only about 10% of all of our calls that we go on result in a director's custody hold. Over all of this time that we've been running, um, I really tried to figure out how to say what we've learned. And I'm still new. I'm still learning every single day something new. <laughs> and so I feel weird even saying, what have we learned? But I tried to put some stuff together here. What I really feel adamantly about is that crisis response is very, very different than outreach and engagement. And I tried to list out kind of why that is. But I wanted to throw out there that both are incredibly important. Most of my time in social work has been in homeless services, and my primary skill set was outreach and engagement. It's what I mostly did my schooling on for my master's, and I really loved it. When I came to Project Respond, I realized I needed a lot of training that was different to respond to emergencies. And here's some of the things that I've learned that we are trying to make sure that we build into our trainings. We are, when you go out on a crisis response, it's not with this idea of, okay, we're gonna just say hi and see how it's going, see if we can offer anything, kind of have a grab bag of resources that we can provide. We have all of that if it gets to there but we are responding to an initial concern, an emergency concern with a mental health component. And so we are going out to determine that concern. What is going on? Asking multiple questions, asking very specific pointed questions about those concerns. We're looking for a potential pre precipitating event or a cause or something that maybe led up to somebody being suicidal expressing homicidal ideation, all of the above. And then we really dive deep into safety and support. And safety is so, so key. That is our framework of most of what we were doing. Are we safe? Are they safe? Are family members safe? Are friends safe? Are the community safe? And how do we figure that out? It's a lot of communication, of course it is. But it's concise, consistent, and direct. Because what we're talking about is the brain most likely being in fight or flight. Someone is scared and feeling like they have an emergency. So you really have to think about the fact that it'll be difficult to retain information. It'll be difficult to like answer complex questions or questions that are potentially long-winded. You have to be really concise. And I wrote this a few different ways. But it's, it's more staff directed than I feel when I was doing outreach and engagement. I am going in with transparency, but I'm saying who I am and immediately getting to my point or trying to get to my point, which is I'm Jackie and I'm here today because somebody called me and they're really worried about you. And then I try to discuss that with the individual if I can. Outreach and engagement. Just to give you kind of the, the other picture is usually I'm coming in saying, hey, how's it going? What's on your mind today? Especially if it's, let's say, outpatient services or if it's outreach and engagement. Hey, I'm just passing through. I'm going to be coming by once a week. I hope that's okay. Is there anything that you're interested in me talking about you with? I work for this organization. We can connect you to resources. It's very different than... I'm coming in to assess for risk. And that is my purview, really small. Building immediate rapport is so key and it's its own skill set. Everybody I work with does it differently, and I learn from them every single day on how to do it better and 
uniquely for every client, but it still is huge because if you don't build rapport, which in turn can provide a little bit of trust between you and the person you're trying to serve, it it's not going to work. If they don't feel like they can trust you, your intervention and trying to talk to them and trying to see what you can do to help is very unlikely to work. So what and how do you do that? It's tricky. It is definitely about transparency and a ton of patience. We do not have any restrictions on how long we can meet with somebody. Our average call time is about an hour, but I've seen calls last 20 minutes and I've seen and been on calls that lasted for three or four hours. And all of that is completely acceptable to us because again, it's unique to the individual, but we are trying to work through how we can get somebody safe for a short term, very short term period of time until we can get other resources to connect them with. And again, I just want to hit on this more. It's about transparency in that I'm coming in saying pretty much exactly why I'm there and trying to call out any of the fears that people absolutely have every right to be feeling, which usually is, are you going to make me go to the hospital? Are you going to make me do something I really am scared and don't want to do? We are never lying to the client. We are never trying to not give them information or not have them be a part of the communication. Because sometimes you do have to step aside and talk to your coworker and see kind of what next steps are. And that can build this, this worry or this distrust. And as I'll say in an, in a slide coming up, we also work with other emergency services, such as police, um, ambulances, a myriad of, of workers. And so when we're talking with them, as much as you can, we want to invite the person we're working with as well for that transparency part. And transparency is really hard when we think we might write a hold. Um, so, so it gets really unique and you have to be pretty darn confident in how you're saying and what you're saying and how you're going to do the next step. And I usually try and repeat it pretty constantly. Hey, I'm going to step out of the room real quick. The reason for that is this, and then I will be right back. And I try to do that even if it seems not important. Because in this fight or flight mode, it feels, it just leaves a lot of room for distrust, which of course would increase anxieties. And our whole point is coming in, decreasing anxieties, de-escalating individuals. And that to me, the key piece of that is figuring out how to make sure that they feel involved in us coming in because usually it was not their choice to have us come in to usually their private space. Something else that's a little different, but equally as important of the things that we've learned is aftercare for staff. Our staff have to be prepared and trained for high levels of safety precaution and incidences. The calls they are going on, we've seen an increase in acuity, an increase in access to weapons, an increase in, honestly, physical violence um, being one of the events that have happened that we are going out to assess. And so we really have made sure now to dive deep into safety procedures, precautions, and trainings on those things. Um, we figured this out, I think, entirely too late and are still figuring out ways to deep, deep brief, not necessarily critical incidences that go, rises to that level, but debriefing just really complex calls, really hard calls, calls that sit with us. And as leadership team, we don't try to decide what that is for the team. We try to, one, in between the leadership team, let each other know if they, if there was a hard call that somebody went on so that we can pretty quickly go and ask how the individual is and what they need for supports. 
And then with a lot of complex calls, it's also getting together for group supervision afterwards and bringing them information from different sources that were there or weren't there. A good example of that is um, with working with police, sometimes policies and procedures can change and it makes things feel a little bit complicated or just unsure. And so we'll gather that information and try and bring it to the team. And then all the gray area that we live in for mental health. Can we do this? Can we not do this? How do we do it? And how do we do it as best as we can? We try to bring those things to group supervision as well. Um, within Cascadia, they wonderfully have their own trauma support team that can come in and talk to staff members after an intense critical incident. Um, we have an employee assistance program. And this one I threw in there too, because I think it's it's really important, even though it's never the most fun thing, a CI review, a critical incident review. Uh, we have quality management at Cascadia, and I want to say they do a really nice job of going through um, incidences that have criteria to be a critical incidence, going through it with us. And even though, unfortunately, it can feel like you're being reviewed on if you did it well or not, it still really is important. Why did we do what we do and did we do everything correctly or as best as we could have with the knowledge that we had? And so I think that's also important um, to just review our procedures and everything that we are doing with these high level safety um, incidences. Um, Something else we've learned, who'd have thought? Um, during these times where we have a workforce shortage, we really tried to hone in um, on what we should do for recruiting. And there's a couple different things I wanna note here um, for recruiting specifically for crisis, for mobile crisis team. You're looking for individuals and questions for individuals to glean a comfort with high intensity and short-term engagement. Again, kind of that picture that I described before, where it's not necessarily just not necessarily the skill set of outreach and engagement, but crisis. Like, how comfortable do you feel going into a high-intensity environment? Lots of fear, lots of emotions. De-escalation is primary. You figuring out safety, and you don't really get to know a lot of the outcomes afterwards. It is very short-term engagement afterwards. You're connecting someone to resources, and then you have to pull out that you've done what your job was, and that can be really hard. It can be really hard to work with somebody, get them into resources, ideally, and then say goodbye, and you hope for the best. So again, you're looking for somebody who's one, comfortable with those high intensity interventions and then very little engagement afterwards. Um, with the workforce shortages, we have a lot of new graduates. We used to um, very much look for someone with at least a few years of experience in the field. And instead, the lead our leadership team decided new grads with, of course, this, this comfort and this want to do mobile mental health crisis response. Um, and we just really honed in on training. And we have had such a positive outcome from that. We find that uh, people graduating who want to get into this work, who'd have thought, are excited about it, who are energized to do specifically crisis work. Um, and then we, as a leadership team, I'll just repeat, have committed to longer, more specialized training. And honestly, I don't feel like that's the worst thing. It could be for new grads or not new grads. In my grad school, and I am hearing this pretty consistently, crisis, like how to intervene in a crisis is not something that's taught. So we are diving deep into our training manual on how and what skills are needed and how best do you do those in a crisis situation. Peer providers, peer providers are so key. It took us entirely too long to incorporate peers into our crisis response. 
We have always had peers as our part of our follow-up care that we provide, but not in the initial response. And now we have peers embedded in our initial response and it has been pivotal. For those of you that aren't familiar with what a peer provider is, it's an individual who goes through a specialized training to talk about their lived experience to others that are potentially going through it or going through something similar. And as you could imagine, that is key when you're thinking about trying to build rapport incredibly quickly in a high intensity moment. Again, who'd have thought? We needed to increase our wages. And wonderfully, Cascadia was able to do that. Um, and we have had pretty good success with hiring since then. The compensation should represent the rising competition, which is such a wonderful state that I feel like social service workers are finally in. So we need it needs to represent that, but it also needs to represent the increased exposure to trauma and dangerous and unpredictable environments that our staff are in every single day. We really need to say compensation for that needs to be higher. And you, I mean, like anything, you want solid, dedicated leadership team whose wages also represent doing about 10 billion different things at once. Um, so yes, you need to really dive into compensation for all of your staff, but that includes leadership team. I have the most incredible leadership team that are so dedicated and just have an incredible insight into what the team needs because of that dedication. I'll get, you know, different emails and calls being like, I think we should do this. And it 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 just blows me away, their insight and availability to figure out what would support the team best. And I've been really impressed with that and really impressed with Cascadia for making sure that our wage compensation also um, is up to where it needs to be to show leadership teams um, that they are also very valued. Part of that that I've learned very recently is also set aside time and funds for leadership bonding and cohesion. We run 24 seven. There is not a moment where we don't feel like there's something we could be doing for client care. Calls are consistently pending. We are always wanting to help out. But where does that leave us? It leaves us absolutely making sure we prioritize client care. But you also need to talk about cohesion between your team members as well. So I just wanted to throw that in that, that very recently we have made sure to set aside time to bond and find team cohesion within our leadership team as well. And I think that's been really pivotal. So now I really want to switch gears a little bit to talk about working with police. We absolutely work with police. We are in some very high acuity, high safety risk situations. And in our community, police officers are the only ones who are allowed and trained to put hands on an individual. We are not trained or allowed to do that. And even some of our emergency services um, are not allowed to do that either. So currently it is police that are going to be our backup. And so what does that look like and how does it work? <laughs> Let me give you a little bit of information there. What I've learned is that there's needs to be an understanding instead of a judgment, which of course gets really hard when you're in your roles and you know how important they are but an understanding more than a judgment that your roles are different, even on the same call. Even on the same call, your roles are different. Your scopes, your policies and procedures, and your trainings are different. And that will leave, lead to a different scope, a different view of each call you're on, even though you're on the same call. And this can lead to differences. Differences in opinion, differences in what the outcome should be, differences in what the next step should be. And so I am adamant about open lines of communication. 
And we've been, I feel pretty lucky in Portland to have stakeholder meetings with entities that all come on these calls with us. So we have police, we have um, BOIC is our 911 dispatcher. We have ambulances represented. We have our county funders represented and anyone else. So if we have a really complex call, I'm able to go to those that are reoccurring. And I got to say, that's really um, important because we can easily put off meetings. But if it's reoccurring and you go, it's so helpful to one, have a streamlined communication and get to know each other a little bit better so that if needed in the moment, I could call somebody and say, here's what's going on. What should we do? Otherwise, it can just be this review of a call which has been really, really helpful for us to one, learn if policies have changed for us to let them know if we're even day-to-day super low staffed or have a training that we have to go to so that it's gonna, it's gonna be really difficult. Like all those kind of things are really helpful when you have those lines of communication. One amazing thing that we have is um, Portland Police offers us a safety training. We actually get to go to their building with, you know, fake apartments, fake houses, and they and their staff do these mock sessions for us. And we get together prior and go over things that we run into all the time. But with the learning objective of around safety things, and it has been incredible and a great collaboration to say we have to be looking out for safety and if and safety in the lens of what police do every single day that's their lens like they they think about safety all day long and so having them provide that safety training to us has been really pivotal pivotal and really important for us we require all of our staff members to go to this training because it's situations we are in every day One of the learning objectives is if somebody's trying to get you to come into a back room, how do you navigate that? If somebody's pulling a lot of stuff, let's say out of their bag or their backpack, and you start to see things that might represent a weapon, how do you feel like you can leave? How do you feel like you get your partner out and leave? Like these are things we go through every single day. So it's really important to us that we have this incredible collaboration and the safety training. I feel bad ending on this slide, but when we talk about mobile crisis, there's there's wonderful things that we've learned, um, which includes collaborations across the board, including police force, but there are some continued struggles. Um, When you think about kind of the creme de la creme of crisis services, it's someone to call, someone to help, and somewhere to go. In our community, I feel we are still really struggling on that somewhere to go. We have a real lack of short-term crisis supports aftercare, um, such as immediate sobering or detox beds, super limited right now. Even let's say a 24 seven respite bed or something like that for someone to go. We have very, very little choices right now. Some other things uh, that we're feeling is of course, which I think most people are, is an, is an increased need um, all around our community for mental health supports. We have a huge workforce shortage for um social service workers, especially in the mental health field. So right now, when we're trying to make referrals, even not just somewhere to go, but also aftercare supports are huge long wait lists. So even mental health outpatient has extremely long wait lists if they're even open. Um, We've also seen a domino effect from some state hospital changes that we've had recently, and it's been increasingly harder to get someone to that level of care. And it's kind of the overall thing that I'm talking about, which is referral pathways. Um, 
I believe that they should have, we should, and crisis services, crisis services should have direct reserved intakes and referrals. If somebody is meeting with us for an emergency situation, we should act like it's an emergency situation and make sure that we can immediately and be, have like preferred slots, which I'm trying to work on, but everything that I've said before also is needed. Like there's a huge increase in our community and we really just don't have the workforce right now to support that. We also need follow-up supports. Um, we have in our state now um, very specific state mandates of what mobile crisis should provide and should look like, which I honestly think is great. Like there is now a standard of care that we can rely on and have to prove we're doing. And a piece of that is within this 72 hours of a mobile crisis response, we have to provide follow-up support. But at this time, we only we haven't gotten the increased funding to potentially add more staff to be able to do that really well. It's just the same staff we have who now have an increased expectation of doing follow-up support that I feel is a little different than that initial crisis response that I really do want to make sure people who want to do that are dedicated just to that for that skill set. And then hopefully down the line, we will be able to find increased funding for staffing to just do those follow-up su supports as well. It's still, you know, in that time frame, it's still a crisis event within those 72 hours. So we'll definitely hone in on making sure there's still skill sets there to meet with an individual that needs that level of care, but also just having more people available to just call somebody after we've been there. How are you doing? What's going on? It sounded like we were going to, you were going to follow up with this and we were going to follow up with this. Does that still sound like something that's working for you? How's it going? It literally just calling somebody and saying, how's it going today? Are you feeling any better? Like that's a wonderful thing. And I love that expectation from the state but the expectation came in and the requirement before we were able to get and ask for more funding. So just a little bit of a miss there. And I wanted to leave you with something happy because I felt bad about the continued struggle slides. So I'm leaving you with my sweet little dog, Roger, um, and my contact information. So again, thank you so much for listening to me and letting me talk about the incredible program that is Project Respond, our mobile crisis team. And I just hope you all um, have a good day. <laughs>